Hi everyone, um, and welcome to our second event in November about uh, data visualization. Today we will have uh, Cara for 10 tips for better text. So as you know, this is a watch and learn session and all the materials will be shared during the presentation. Uh, but if you would like to do a learn, make sure to have uh, the latest version of uh, R or R Studio or to access to positive cloud so you can have all the capabilities of uh, R. Um, as you know, or maybe not, November is the um, month of uh, data visualization. And this is the reason why we have decided to host uh, two events about data visualization in this month. Um, the first one was uh, November 10 with uh, Cedric. And uh, if you are curious and you haven't attended, you can check out it on YouTube, our channel. And then today with Cara Thompson. So we are really honored to welcome her that she is a field expert in building story with data. It's really important. Um, I will share some activities about our chapter and the initiative, and then I will uh, end it over the floor to our speaker. So we are Francesca and Federica. Federica, she is the lead organizer uh, of Our Ladies Rome, and I am a co-organizer with her. So we organize talks, workshops, tutorials, and anything that you would like and you can suggest to us, obviously. We are sponsored by our consortium, and our mission is to promote the R language within the data science community. We both are statisticians and actuaries, and Federica is really passionate about data visualization. Uh, myself, I'm really interested in this field, but I am more passionate uh, risk management. So what is Air Ladies? Uh, it's a global organization with the mission of promoting our language and empowering women at all user level. And we also want to build a collaborative global network. It's a gender diversity and friendly community founded by Gabriela De Chiaros in 12, uh, 2012 uh, in San Francisco. And is a worldwide organization. So we have a lot of chapter. Our chapter is a local one, is our ladies room and have uh, the same mission that obviously our ladies global uh, has. As uh, already said, we are, um, me and Federica, uh, to organize There is also Katie that today can attend. And we are always open to new joiners. So if you want to contribute and help us in this journey, you can write an email to this, um, this account that you can find here. We do, as already said, talks, uh, hands-on workshop, coding session, really different and various uh, things about uh, different uh, topics. But our passion is obviously for our programming, data science and statistics. So um, topics, uh, recent topics were being about machine learning, Quarto and Tidyverse. And in January, we will uh, be partnering with Our Ladies Paris for a, an, a joint event. So if you are interested, stay tuned. Um, we are an open collective, so we rely on contribution and engagement of our members. So if you are interested in helping us, you can check out uh, to this link. And then we can start with today's presentation. So. Um, you uh, you for sure have already read the, the, the bio of Cara and uh, probably Google there or <laughs> search her on LinkedIn. This is why you are here, most probably. So I will leave the floor to Cara to start this journey. And thank you again for uh, attending this event.
Great. Um, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen um, and then I will introduce myself uh, more properly. Um, so hopefully you can you can see my screen, uh, the, the title slide of my presentation. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, I'm I'm Cara, um, and uh, I'm a data visualization consultant. Um, and what that means is that I've made it my mission in life to to help people make better graphs, um, whether that's uh, better versions of normal graphs or more artistic expressions of patterns in the data. Um, it's about creating something that will spark conversation, uh, that will make the story memorable, um, and that ultimately will keep conversations going. Um, about the work that, that other people are doing. Um, I really enjoy uh, doing it, and um, it's a real privilege to be here with you all this evening. Um, this is my last speaking engagement of the year, um, and I was counting up how many I've done. I think I've done nine talks or workshops um, this year, including this one. Um, and alongside this, I've been preparing some training materials every two weeks for an organization who have, um, we've been doing some data visualization training with them uh, across different platforms and different tools. So not just our stuff, but principles and how we apply that. Um, so that's been every two weeks for the last four months. So I'm, I'm exhausted, but it's been really good. And um, I've learned a lot and it's been fun. And I'm just delighted to, to have this opportunity. Um, to do this with you as my last one of the year. So thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation to do this. So we're going to be talking about um, tips for better text um, and how we make our graphs use text well um, so that everything looks uh, looks as it should. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm Cara Thompson. Um, and the way I ended up here really was growing up with um, a love for patterns in music. You can guess from some of the stuff in my background. Um, and also in language, um, and I was thinking, you know, in the run up to Our Ladies in Rome, uh, you know, the, the bits of Italian that I know have come from opera and from music notations. So I have fond memories of family holidays where my dad, who's also a musician, tried to explain that we wanted the petrol tank filled up a little bit, but not completely to the, to the top. And so used the musical notation of un poco ma non troppo, which kind of did the job, but it's probably not the phrase to use. And um, so I just have, have had this passion for um, patterns in music and language and how the brain makes sense of these. Um, and from that, I, I had the privilege of combining those in a PhD in psychology, where I had fun playing people um, sentences which didn't quite make sense and also pieces of music where there was a chord that belonged to a different key and seeing how the brain reacted to that and the similarities between all of those. Um, that wasn't something that people were particularly interested in funding when I got to the end of that, uh, but I took the analysis side of it and applied it to the world of medical examinations uh, to try and help uh, surgeons and other people writing medical exams write good exams and see what was happening in the data and how they could make them as good a measurement tool as possible. And then during that time, um, I went on maternity leave um, and thought I should probably do something to keep my keep my stats going and discovered the Tidy Tuesday community on Twitter um, and saw Cedric, who you had um, last time, doing some amazing stuff with ggplot that I did not know was possible. Um, and just really learned from, from doing those challenges um, and saw that you could do so much more in ggplot than, uh, than what I'd imagined and uh, caught the bug and never really looked back. And so now I enjoy taking these skills to different organizations and helping them make the most of their data. And what drives me in all of this is helping other people maximize the impact of their expertise. And so where I can automate stuff for them, I do. Where I can remove some decision making for them, I do. Um, and ultimately, it's so that they can then use their time in the way where they can add uh, the most value to the work that they're doing. So if that's you, you're here and you're thinking, I'm looking for some shortcuts in data viz. I want to make it look good, but I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel every single time. And um, hopefully you will walk away from this with some reusable uh, bits of code um, and some tips that you can apply uh, regardless of the projects that you are working on. Um, we're going to be covering 10 tips for making text better. So that's quite a lot to get through um, and it will be fairly fast paced, but I will um, pop the slides, uh, which include the code, up on my website uh, once we're done. And so you can go to my talks page and uh, find out some more about that. Um, there's also on there the links to talks that I've given recently and the slides that go along with that. Uh, so it's, it's quite a fun resource, I think, um, of ways to, to look at different plots. 
Um, you'll see that there are themes that come up um, time and time again, but I think every talk is still a little bit different. Um, so we're going to be using the Bake Off data. Um, where we have finished the Great British Bake Off, uh, the re most recent series here in the UK, um, which is something that I really enjoy watching. There's something very relaxing about watching people getting so stressed about cakes. I'm not quite sure what that says about me, um, but it's been great. But I haven't finished watching the last one, so no spoilers, please, um, in the chat, because I do not know yet who has won this latest season. But we're going to be using the Bake Off package uh, by Alison Hill. Um, and just as way of um, housekeeping, I'm going to be using namespacing. So that's using the name of the package and then the double colon and then the function uh, that I'm using. Um, the two reasons for that, one, it's generally good practice. It keeps your code tidy and it avoids you loading a function that has the same name as the function that you in, 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 intentionally were going to use, but uh, initially we're going to use, but it's in a different package and it's a different function and that gets very confusing. Um, and it's also to uh, make it easy for you to retrace our steps and install the packages that you need in order to, to redo what we're doing. Um, choose your own pipe. Um, I like the old one. It's got a few things that it can do that the new one can't do, uh, but I probably flip between the two in the code and don't let that worry you. Um, and all the codes on the slide will be available on my talks page. Um, and if you try this again at home in your own time and you get stuck, um, send me an email. I'm more than happy to more than happy to help. Um, yeah, it's just it's fun being part of this community. And so if I can help in, in any way, then I will. Uh, before we can do anything with text, we need to set up a basic plot. So let's do that. Um, this is just some basic data wrangling. Um, I've loaded the entire tidyverse, and I make no apology for doing that. Um, and we're going to take the data inside the Bake Off package that's called Challenges. And I'm going to uh, just find all the different bakes that are in there and uh, do a bit of pivoting and tidy up some of the text and then extract from it the key components that we're interested in plotting. These are taken, um, I'm going to say, completely at random, although one of them is not quite random. So cho I like chocolate, I like raspberry, I like the combination of the two. Rhubarb, good classic British flavor there. Um, and then I included the Genoas or the sponge because um, they, they always say Genoas in a funny way. And my sister-in-law thought if I had an opportunity to tell the world how that should be pronounced, um, I should go for it. So Genoas uh, or sponge, chocolate rhubarb um, and raspberry. And then we're going to count how many times um, those are used in the bakes of the Bake Off. This is kind of immaterial to what we're going to be doing for the rest of the session. We just need to get hold of some data so that we can create a plot. Uh, but this is what our table looks like. Uh, so this is what we're going to be feeding into the plot. Um, and if you got confused by the wrangling, do not worry. Just look at the table um, and it will make sense of what we're going to do. So we're going to take that key components table that I just showed you, which just had one column of the components and one column counting how many times they were used. And we're going to feed that into a ggplot. We're going to say that on the x-axis, we want the components. And on the y-axis, we want the count. And then we're going to color um, things according to which components was being used. Um, and then we're going to just create a bar plot. So I'm going to say geom bar uh, with stat equals identity, because we've given it the values that we want on the, the y-axis. So let's have a look. See what that does. There we go. We have a plot. This is always a good start for these kind of sessions. So we've got our plot here, uh, which has got a legend and it's got bars. And now we need to make it a little bit better. So there's a few things that we can do. Um, and I've got some tips to share as we go. My first tip is to use theme minimal, which just gets rid, rid of that um, gray background and declutters a little bit. And then we should probably add a little bit of text because that's what we've said we're going to do today. So I've added a title and a subtitle, uh, which is quite long. Oops, as you can see in here, if I scroll along, um, it's a long subtitle and it goes off the edge of the plot. Uh, but don't worry, we're going to fix that later. So we've got that sorted. I'm going to make the text size a little bit bigger. And theme minimal has a really handy feature in that you can specify the text size using the base size argument. So we've gone from the default, which I think is 11 to 18 um, here. And then we're going to set our bars in a sensible order. Uh, again, it just helps people when they're engaging the story um, if they're not having to jump around all over the place to see what's going on. So we've got the bars sorted and we've arranged them. We arranged the data frame by the count and then we've created a factor um, that has the components in the order that they appear in once we've arranged it. 
And then I'm going to suggest that we flip it on its side uh, because the labels were a bit long and overlapping when they were at the bottom, or at least they were in danger of overlapping if we made them any bigger. Whereas if we put them at the side, and um, we've got a little bit more space for everything to, to be there and we don't have to have people kind of breaking their necks to, to read the text that's going on there. Um, and then we're going to use plain English in our axes. So we've put the labels where we need to, and then rather than it just saying count, we're going to say number of bakes because that makes it a little bit easier to figure out what's going on. So that's another mini tip there you know, to use plain English. So at this point, we have a plot and it's perfectly functional. It's got the stuff that we need. It's got the information in there. And you could use that in a report if you wanted to. But in looking at it, there's just, there's a lot of information going on. There's lots of different colors. I'm, I'm having to look at the legend and then back at the bars and they're not in the same order and that's confusing me. And I think we can do better. So um, let's use this as our starting point and see what we can do. The first thing we're gonna do and my top, tins on, top tips on using text better, that's quite hard to say, um, is to decrease our reliance on text. Um, now, in fact, at this point, your reaction is this. That's probably the right reaction. You came here to get some tips about text. And I'm, my, the first thing I'm saying is let's, let's use less of it. Um, I'm going to say let's decrease our reliance on text so that we can use it better. Um, and if we don't need as much text, and we can do better things with it. Um, and one of the ways um, that we can do this is to use the notion of color symbolism. So if I ask you, um, this is quite interesting actually, with an international crowd at this workshop, if I ask you which one is uh, Booba and which one is Kiki, let's say we've got um, A here and B here. So is Booba A or is Booba B? Can you tell me in the chat? Yeah. It's people are responding. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So um, there is a consensus, right? So Booba is this one. The, the rounded shapes um, evoke the tie to the sounds, whereas Kiki is the most, it's kind of more spiky. You can you can hear the spikes somehow uh, when you say that. So this is the notion of sound symbolism, um, which has been around since the, the end of the 1920s. And people are still looking into it today um, to try and figure out exactly what is driving it. Uh, but it seems to be a fairly, well-recognized phenomenon and um, across different languages, across different cultures, that we have this kind of connection between what things look like and what they sound like. And the sounds are pretty shared as well, uh, which is which is quite fun. So what we're gonna do is try and do the same thing, but with colors. And um, so I have created a color palette that made me very hungry the first time I saw it on the screen. Um, and I think it was the rhubarb color that did it for me. Uh, but here we go, we've got some chocolate, some raspberry, some sponge, and some rhubarb. Um, hopefully those colors are working for you on the screen that you're on um, as well. It's before dinner time here, probably missed the boat for cake time. Uh, but uh, yeah, this, this is the kind of stuff that would be nice to have in a cake. Now, if we create this, we're gonna create it as a named vector. Um, so we're gonna say chocolate equals, and then the color, and raspberry equals, and the color, and um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I'm then just using monochroma, which is a package that I wrote um, to, to manipulate colors in R, um, to, to view the palette and see, uh, see what it looks like. So we've got that sorted, um, and now we can go and apply it to our plot. Here is our basic plot that we set up earlier, and let's add some colors into it, um, and you can see, that it's, it's a little bit easier to remember what's going on and to remember that chocolate is the one that stands out at the top. We've got a nice chocolate colored bar at the very top of this plot. Um, no one's gonna forget that chocolate was the most commonly used ingredient um, in the bakes that we were looking at. But once we've done that, we can also get rid of the legend. Actually, we could have got rid of the legend earlier because the legend was just redundant with what's on the axes. Um, but we've got, um, clear enough connections between what the bars represent and their colors that I think people will not feel um, that they're missing a legend if we get rid of the legend, it's all it's all there for them. We can also get rid of the axis title, uh, Y axis, we don't need to specify that these are the components because it's pretty obvious. Um, and so in decreasing our reliance on text, as you can see, we have colors so that it's more obvious what's what. Um, and we've also removed a bit of text that was unnecessary. Uh, so we've got rid of this legend, 
and we've got rid of this access title here. And this is one of the, the main bits of feedback that I give to people when I provide training in different organizations, is have a look at your plot and figure out whether you need all that text. Do you need the legend um, or not? Or can you just get rid of it and the plot still works? And a lot of the time, uh, the plot still works. If it doesn't, we can look at some in-plot annotations. So that's what we're going to have a look at as well. Um, before we do that, we want to add a bit of text hierarchy to our plots. Now, text hierarchy is one of those things that it's so much easier to uh, describe, uh, to, to show than it is to describe with words. So have a look at this um, image. Um, so this, the way that this is formatted um, guides us as to what we should read first. Um, so we'll probably all gravitate to the big text and read that first. And then we'll read the subtitles. And then there's other bits that we might skip over entirely and other bits that we might come back to. Now, when we're creating a data visualization, we want to be in charge of what the main thing to read is, what people can skip over, what they can come back to if they need. And so there are ways of doing this by formatting. Um, as you can see here, it's a combination of color and text size that does it um, in most instances. So we're going to do that. We were. Um, and we're going to just change all of the, we're going to change the text color um, so that the default text color across our plot is a kind of dark brown. Um, I think my internet connection went a bit funny there. Am I still with you? You can still hear? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to change the text color across the plot uh, using text equals element text color and just change it there. Um, if, if you're not familiar with changing colors in R, you can also use uh, named colors such as uh, you know, dark red or black or white. Um, the kind of default CSS colors will be recognized, but we want to add a bit more subtlety. So we're going to change to specific hex codes that we're providing here. So we're going to make all the text brown. Um, and then we're going to do the same thing in the axis text because theme minimal has opinions about what color the axis text should be. So we need to overwrite that. Um, and then we're going to make the text of the title a bit darker. Now, I fully appreciate this is very subtle um, and maybe doesn't even come across well on uh, a screen on slightly different colors. Uh, we've got a darker text here for the title than we do for the axes and for the rest of the text in the plot. And then we're going to make that title bigger. So we're going to change the size um, just using the size argument. Let's see, we're going to put some fonts into this. Um, so we're going to use different fonts. Um, I've got a font uh, for the, the title. Uh, I think it's... Um... Just to show that we can do fun things. And then we change the text to cabin across the plot. And, and this is what it looks like. So we've got a plot now that has a bit of personality rather than just being the, the, the default fonts that we get lots. Um, and all we need to do is just change the, the family argument there. Um, now, I say all we need to do, getting fonts to work in R can be really, really frustrating. Um, so if you've got R Studio open, um, what you can type in um, is this line here. So system fonts, I'll just pop, copy it into the chat. Um, if, you, if you type that in, the system fonts, system fonts um, it will tell you uh, which fonts you have installed on your computer um, and which fonts R um, has access to. So you'll, it'll generate a data, uh, data frame that you can open up and have a look at. And you can scroll through that and see the names of the fonts that you've got installed. And um, if you don't have anything there that you like or you want to start again with a different font, um, then you can go to Google Fonts or your alternative uh, foundry of choice. Um, and you can uh, choose a font that you like the look of. Then you click on Download Family. And um, that will give you a zip file. And then to work nicely in R, you want to extract the font files um, and look for the TTF files, uh, the true type fonts. So once you've got those, um, those are the ones that are going to work nicely in R Studio. There are other types of font files, uh, which some of them work really well, some of them don't play quite as nicely. So my recommendation, if you, this is your first uh, go at trying custom fonts, is to try this. Um, if you're on Windows, you right click and you make sure you install for all users. Um, I think Mac's uh, slightly more intuitive when it comes to fonts. Um, and then you want to restart our studio. Um, and then the next time you call this command, you should see that font appear in your 
data frame. Did that make sense? Uh, I realized it was a pretty quick, quick go. So here we, why don't I go, go to Google Fonts, um, and you can search for different fonts of different types. So you can say, I want a slab font, for example. Um, and let's try this one. I don't think I've installed this. So there, I'll come to some tips for choosing a font um, in just a minute, but let's say we like the look of the Sanchez font. And what you would then say is download family. Once you've clicked on it, you download the font family and then you open it up. And uh, once you're in that folder, um, yeah, you can only see my browser, can't you? Uh, but once you've downloaded, you're, you're in your download folder, um, and then you extract the fonts, and you right click and say install, and it will install them um, on your computer. And you may need to restart the studio after that to get it to recognize them, but it should, should do the job. Um, and then there are a few things that we need to do once we've done that. So we've installed our fonts on a computer, um, and then you probably want to restart our studio. And if you've got the system fonts package installed, it will have also installed the rag package and the text shaping package. So those will be dependencies of that package. They should already be there. Then what you want to do is set your graphics device to AGG. So you can see that in your RStudio options. Um, if you go into your options um, and then click on the general, um, thing on the side here. Where am I? Move my mouse. There we go. Click on general and then click on the graphics tab. You should get a drop down here. Um, and you want to make sure that you have set that to AGG. There are several options. And so that's that's maybe why the fonts haven't worked for you when you've tried that in the past. Um, and the other trap um, that, you, that you need to be aware of is if you're using um, these fonts in a markdown document or a quarter document, sometimes you can get it so that it renders really nicely in your RStudio plot viewer, and then it doesn't work in the document. And you, I've spent so much time scratching my head to figure, try and figure out where that is. There is a simple solution to that, which is to set dev equals um, rag PNG in your knitter options. And then that aligns everything so that your graphics device is using the same thing to generate the fonts. I don't know the technical terms. I just know that it works. So this is the way to do it. Um, if you get stuck in using fonts, um, there's an absolutely brilliant blog post uh, by Jun Cho, which is about um, installing and debugging fonts. Um, and he goes through uh, so many of the, re the issues that you might have and lots of fun things that you can do with icons. I have never managed to get Font Awesome to work. It, I, it's always a headache getting that to work. Um, but if you get stuck, um, yeah, this is a, a really great uh, resource to use. Um, so great. Thank you for posting that in the chat. That's great. We have a question. Uh, yeah, so Ahmad, you're asking about uh, the font size in um, our markdown documents. You need to play around with the figure size, um, so the figure height and the figure width um, that you can specify in your, your code chunk options, um, and that should get you around the issue. Um, so have a go at uh, doing that, um, and if that still doesn't work, then send me an email and I'll, I'll take another look at it. Um, so we've got all these things set up, um, but you will still at some point reach um, a moment with playing with fonts where you just want to throw everything in the bin um, and start again, because it does get very frustrating. But uh, I'm hoping that these, these things will have made it easier for you. So this is very much the nitty gritty of how to get it to work. Um, let's, let's see the Im impact that it has. So remind ourselves, we had our plot with uh, some text hierarchy. We've got a bigger title, a smaller subtitle, some personality, a bit of color. Um, but our subtitle was going off the edge of the plot, so we needed to fix that. The way to fix that is to use uh, ggtext element text box simple. Um, so if you use that to define your subtitle, what it does is it puts your subtitle inside a box, and that box automatically wraps to the width of your plot, um, which is a huge time saver and through all the time that you can spend trying to figure out where you need a line break when you're adding a subtitle to your plot. I'm seeing Federica nodding and laughing, so you have been there. Um, it's, so yeah, Element Textbook Simple, absolutely brilliant. Um, the only thing to watch out for is uh, your alignments. Um, so the more text you have, the more space that box takes up, and it can shift around a little bit. So we can fix that alignment, um, and we can say that V just equals 1. So make sure that the, the box starts 
um, at the bottom of the title rather than having an alignment that's in the middle, which would allow it to expand kind of either side and overlap with the title. So you set the alignment there, and then we also need to give it some space to breathe. Um, and we do that with the, the margin argument as well. So we've added a margin around our text box symbol for the subtitle, and we've added a margin around our title as well. Um, and the way that I remember uh, which one is which for this is the word trouble. So top, right, bottom, left. Um, that's how you specify these. And the default unit is points, and as is the default unit for the size here. So everything lines up nicely. And try to use multiples of each other. So you've got 24 here and 12 here. Um, that should mean that the spacing um, is pleasing to, to look at. So we've added some text hierarchy, and you can see the difference here. Here's our before and after shot. Um, it does make a difference. It means that when you're looking at the plot, you're not overwhelmed with the fact that there's lots of text. Your eye just goes to something simple to look at and then moves on to the next thing. So we're really helping people engage uh, with the story that we've, that we've created. At this point, you probably want to spend a bit of time packaging it up if this is something that you're going to be using again. This is what our code um, currently looks like. We've got our plot, and then we're setting theme minimal, and then we're doing a bunch of modifications on that. And what we really want, if we're creating several plots, is something like this, a plot and then theme bake-off, so that you can just use theme bake-off rather than copy-pasting everything. I don't have time to go into detail on how to do that, but I have done that um, in my variations on a GG theme um, talk that I gave uh, at the NHSR conference. Um, that was last year, not this year. Uh, but what you do is you create a function that is based on theme minimal with all your modifications in it. And you can feed it a text color, you can feed it a base text size. Um, and then that means that you just have to do something like this and you get your plot applied uh, with, with the theme applied to it with just one line of code. Um, I enjoy doing this kind of stuff um, for, for clients and packaging it up in a, in a custom package for them. Uh, so here's one that I, I wrote for the Ophelia project, uh, which you just add theme Ophelia and it adds a bit of a background color. It changes the fonts uh, in the text. It does the subtitle um, inside a box and just sorts out a bunch of things. Um, and you can also add a color scheme into packages and things like that. So if that's something that you want to look into more, um, have a look at the, the database design um, system talks that I've given as well. So we have, what have we done? <laughs> we've added some text hierarchy and we've reduced our reliance on text by adding um, good sensible colors. Um, now we're going to reduce unnecessary eye movement um, in the text and we're going to start adding some in-plot annotations. So here is our basic plot with some text hierarchy. You can see I have named it extremely creatively um, up here. It just helps us remember where we are. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the gap that we had at the start uh, by changing the expansion. Um, of the Y um, scale. And then I'm going to add some text boxes. So my favorite way of adding text boxes is again, um, ggtext. Um, so ggtext geom text box does that. Um, we've got a question to align the title text and the bars on the chart. Yes, there is. Um, in the theme, you need to say something like title position equals plot. Um, I, will, I will look into that for you. <laughs> Um, so we've got the geom text box thing. Because we've already said what's on the x-axis and the y-axis, all we need to do is add a label, put a box, um, which the middle of the box corresponds to the end of the bar, because that's the, uh, the, the coordinate that we've given it. So we've got boxes at the end of the bars. We're going to just flip into debugging mode and make them white so you can actually see where they are and see what they're doing. Um, probably not the most pleasing box um, to look at just there. So let's make the text size a bit bigger. And then we're going to align the boxes so that the edge of the box um, but that we've given it. So you can see that the, the coordinate for the chocolate, uh, chocolate box, chocolate box um, is here and the box lines up to that coordinate, butts up to it, because we've said uh, that we wanted the H just and the H align to both be equal to one. So the H, one of them adjusts where the box sits with the coordinate, and the other one adjusts where the text sits inside that. Um, and if you Google my alignment cheat sheets, you'll tell you'll find out which one's which. But um, you can you can play around with them and figure out whether you want the box to align or the text to align. But basically, if you set them both to the same thing, they're both on the same side, which is which is what we want to be doing here. So we've got our, top, our boxes that are aligned to the end of the bars, and then what we can do is do a bit of conditional alignment. So 
um, if you've used uh, case when before, then you'll be familiar with this syntax. Um, we're going to say if the count is less than 50, then we're going to align the box one way. And if the count is greater than 50, which is the true, so that's the catch all for things that don't meet this, uh, this condition, then we're going to align the box the other way around. So we've got the same thing for H just and H align. Um, and so we can make sure that that works. And it does. So we've said when the count is greater than 50, so this is our 50 line. Um, then we're going to align them as we had before. If the count is smaller than 50, then we're going to make the alignment zero. And so that means that the box flips to the other side of the coordinate and the text uh, goes to the right side of the box as well. So that we've got everything lining up nicely based on where it is in the, in the graph. So far so good. We've got some text boxes and some conditional alignments and uh, to just reduce a little bit of eye movement. And then why not do the same thing with color, right? So we can say, if the uh, box is uh, going to be outside of it, then we want the text to be dark. If the box is going to be inside the bar, then we want the text to be white. So it's the same condition that we've applied there. So let's do that and see what happens. This did not do what we thought it was going to do. Um, and the reason for that is that R thinks that we've created um, some extra factor levels that they need to create some colors for. So um, what we need to do to fix this is simply to say scale color identity. Um, and then that will mean that everything's colored how it should be. Now, obviously, we have a problem because we cannot see the white text on top of the white bars uh, inside, inside, inside of the white boxes in these bars. And um, so we need to get rid of the backgrounds and we need to get rid of the color of the box. Um, and then we can also add in the uh, fonts that we have decided to and make it bold so that it's nice and legible. So this is just a little bit of extra formatting. Uh, we've got rid of the the color of the box, um, and we've given it the personality that aligns with the rest of, of the plot here. And um, we need to do this separately to the theming because the theme only applies, the theme doesn't apply to the stuff that's inside GG text and um, Geon text box. So we need to make sure that we repeat what font we want and the colors that we want, and so on and so forth. So we've got that sorted. Uh, we're going to get rid of the y axis because we've put the same text at the end of the bars. Um, so we don't need it there anymore. And then we might as well add the count in. So again, uh, what we can do here is add the components and then the count. Um, and because Geom Textbox uses Markdown, uh, we can do a bit of styling as well. So we can have a line break. Um, and we can also say we're going to make the font size big um, for the count. Uh, but we're going to leave it normal for the component. So the interesting thing that we're looking at is the value and then the the fact that it says chocolate is a nice reminder that this is chocolate that we're looking at, but because the color is obvious, we don't need the text to be quite as obvious. Um, so the, the value of interest is, is made to be the bigger value there. So we've got that. We can tweak our alignment. Um, just the, the vertical alignment was slightly off, so I've adjusted it there. Um, and then we can get rid of some axis text and some um, grids as well, because we've got all the information there, and we don't really need to be more precise than that. Um, this is a rough count. You know, it's not a it's not a bar graph that anybody is going to be basing um, the life decisions on uh, based on very precise measures. And um, so the fact that this does this and it does it accurately with the data it means that we can probably get away without having the grids there as well. Just declutter everything um, and make the main thing stand out. Um, so we've got that sorted. Um, and then I was kind of thinking. If I was saying how many chocolate bakes there were, I would say there were 206 chocolate bakes. I wouldn't say chocolate bakes 206. So I've just reordered the label um, so that it's in the order of how I would actually say it. So always say to yourself, how would I say this? Um, and then try and arrange your labels in such a way that it makes sense. Um, I'm seeing somebody having their, their mind uh, exploding about all the styling that we can do with case when, yes, it's great, it's really useful. Um, and very, very, very handy. So I'm glad that this has been a, a good revelation. So we've reduced unnecessary eye movement by putting all the information at a sensible place. So we've looked at, um, you know, we want to see how long the bars are, we want to see what the value is, um, and we can easily put a label there at the end of the bar um, to make sure that it all fits nicely and that it gives us the information where we're looking at it. Uh, yeah, we have a question. Yeah, we we've got some some questions. Uh, such from from the the back, the last one. Does this also work with Theme Classic? Um, I assume so. I've not actually used Theme Classic. Let me just have a quick look at it. 
Um, let's see. Yeah, theme classic is in the same family as uh, theme minimal. So you can also, yeah, you can do that. You can change the size. Um, with all of the themes, you can always do, uh, you know, plus theme and then do some extra modifications on top of that. Um, so yeah, you can you can keep modifying any of the themes that are there. One more is advice for colors for male and female, other than blue and pink. Do you have a yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one because you want to make it obvious, but you also don't want to fall into stereotypes. So I've seen a lot of people use um kind of green and purple. Um, and that's that's used quite well. Uh, I think blue and pink actually switched around, didn't they, over the centuries as to which one was considered to be the feminine color and, and the more masculine color. Um, so yeah, I would say try to avoid stereotypes, but also don't make it really difficult for people to figure out what's what. Um, so yeah, I think I think purple and green have have been quite successful um, as ways of doing that. The other thing that you could do is start from a common color and then go towards pink from that color and towards blue from that color as well if you wanted to and then that would mean that you would end up you know with a turquoise and a something else i haven't really thought about the rest of it um but yeah it, it is tricky okay i think we've answered the questions that we have so far um so yeah i will i'll crack on but yeah it, i think i really enjoy doing these things and showing the before and after because you can see the difference that it makes it seems like such a small thing to do uh, but it, it is worth it um, the next thing I'm going to say is declutter, declutter, declutter. We've already decluttered that one at this point. You might be saying, that's fine, that was easy. You just had four lines of data. Easy peasy, easy peasy. Okay, let's do this in hard mode. Um, we're going to take the Bake Off data, and we're going to look at how each of the series winners performed in each of the technicals throughout the episodes um, that they were in. So we are joining in the bakers, filtering so that we're just selecting the ones that actually won. Um, and then we're going to plot this um, to say the X is episode, the Y is technical, and we're going to see what this looks like. And yeah, this is this is messy. Uh, if this, this is your reaction, then that is the, the right reaction to have to that plot. So where do we go from there? We could try facets. Small multiples are a really good way of showing uh, patterns when there's just too much data to put in one plot, uh, provided that you can create the multiples based on sensible groupings. Um, so Here's what it looks like with um, facets. It still doesn't really help, does it? There was no place to put the legend in and I had to hide the code because there was just too much data there. So, okay, what about if we try facets on less data? Try and shrink it down a little bit. So we're just gonna filter for the series six to eight um, and see what happens there. And we're getting towards something more sensible, but it's still quite hard to figure out um, what the, what's going on there with the data. So. At this point, I want to introduce you to GG Highlight, um, which is a really great way of pulling out just one strand of the spaghetti that there was um, in the rest of that plot. So we've got, uh, we want to pull out the, the strands that correspond to the series winners and see how they performed in those episodes. And so here we've got them. Uh, we've got the green one, the red one, and the blue one, but there's a whole load of data uh, behind that that looks like more people than participated in each um, series. So the thing that I learned in preparing this the, the set of materials um, was that you need to specify calculate per facet equals true when you're using GG Highlight. Um, otherwise, it will just put everything in every single facet, which is not the behavior that you want. So calculate per facet equals true uh, will get you out of that mess and have slightly less spaghetti going on. Um, on your plate. So we're going to do that. We have removed the extra ones um, and then we're going to color the um, the lines that we want to highlight by series just to make it look pretty. This isn't particularly informative in terms of coloring, but sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of an aesthetic going on um, through your plots. Never reuse a color that means something though and to make, make it mean something else. Use a color um, that's just pretty or use colors that, that mean something, but try to not mix and match. Uh, so we've just applied uh, a color gradient um, that went through three colors um, in doing so, and that has given us some colors to use there. And then one of my favorite packages at the moment, um, I seem to have lots of favorite packages, GG Text, GG Highlights, and Geom Text Path is absolutely brilliant. Um, it allows you to add labels that follow the, uh, the line um, that they correspond to. 
So they go in the same direction of the line. Um, if this was a curved line, the text can actually follow the curve. Um, it's really quite clever. And you can either have the text embedded within the line or you can have it above the line. Um, so yeah, you can you can play around with the formatting for that, uh, but it allows you to put um, put labels um, on lines in a way that's quite fun and I think quite unique to to R and ggplot. Um, we then want to add some text boxes to show how the bakers did at the start and how they did at the end. So we're putting their rank at the start and their rank at the end, and this is just the same kind of wrangling that we did earlier. Okay, in terms of uh, grabbing the data, adding it in as a label. Uh, there's nothing there's nothing new here uh, compared to what we did and you can take my word for it for now and then revisit the code um afterwards do the same thing that we did earlier with the conditional alignments as well we're going to say if it was the first episode of the series then we're going to align it on this side if it was the last episode of the series then we're going to align it on this side instead and um, so then our text boxes look great but they don't actually fit on our plot so we need to fix that um and uh, yeah, change the change the boxes and change the styling. And there we go. So we've got how they did in the first episode of the series, how they did in the last episode of the series, what the name was, and the name follows the, the curve that corresponds to that person. Adding in a bit of personality, we're gonna change um, our styling. Um, and what have I done with this one? Oh yes, I've changed the facet titles. So rather than it just saying six, seven, eight, it now says series six, series seven, series eight. Um, and you can do that by feeding a function into the labeler of your facet grid. So when you're using a facet grid, you can change the labels like this, um, which uh, is very useful. Hopefully this all makes sense still to everyone still with me. Yeah, the pace is picking up, uh, which it always does once you've established a few foundations um, for a talk. Hopefully you're all still with me. So we've got the, the series labeled nicely in the facets. Um, we're going to then just add the uh, the personality in with some fonts and a bit of sizing. So we've got text hierarchy everywhere, going to give everything some space to breathe uh, with some margins down here as well. Um, and then, what am I doing here? Not entirely sure. Oh, yes, I changed the NA color. That was it. So it's very subtle, but the gray is a slightly different color. Um, don't worry if you can't see that on the screen. Um, it's just decluttering, not having colors in there that don't belong in there um, that cause an extra extra bit of visual information. Make the text size, so the text size bigger so that it works nicer. And here we go. So we've gone from a slightly harder plot to declutter to one that does actually do the job um, in which you can follow the trajectory of um, the, the Bake Off contestants that you were interested in following all the way through the data. So geom text path do text um, and there you go all these all these options that you can play around with and um, this is a really quick one um, but one that i think is very useful try to tie your text to the data by using color so use a color for the labels that is the same color as what you've used for your lines um, and we get something that looks like this again all we've done here is added a color argument to the aesthetics of geom text path and it's colored it by series, which is what we had done for the line as well. So again, simple, simple, just one line of code and it does the job. We can do the same thing for the text boxes as well, so that how they ranked at the start and at the end works. And this is nice because it avoids getting confused about which labels belong in which plots. It's probably obvious here because that one's at the top and that one's not. But if you had lots of plots that were close together with labels either side, if they are united through the color, um, it makes it easier. But we don't need that legend, so we can get rid of that. Um, and you can see we've tied the text to the data. And again, here's the before and after. It's a small step, um, uh, but it does make a difference. And it makes it, again, look a bit less cluttered uh, because your eye doesn't have to guess uh, what's going on or process lots of different things. The color just ties it all in um, together. So neglected tables. Tables are a type of data visualization as well. I'm just going to whiz through this, and you can have a look at the code. Um, on my website if you want to revisit it. But here is our starting point. This is a very basic table. Um, this is made with React tables, so it means that it's interactive um, and you can reorder stuff um, at will. And again, this is all Bake Off information, how people did in the various episodes. So I'll walk through exactly the same tips as we've just talked about, but applying them to the tables and you can see the difference that it makes. So we're going to reduce cognitive load by using plain English in our headers. We've changed them from 
you know, viewers seven UK or whatever it was to viewers within seven days. Um, we're going to make the dates work, but in doing this, I kind of thought this would be helpful and it does them alphabetically. So actually it's not in date order at all. So don't do that. That was a bad idea. Um, just format them in a way that is consistent um, and that will be easy to read. Um, we're going to make numbers easy to compare by having them all have the same number of digits um, or be rounded to the same level. So previously they looked like this, um, which makes it hard to compare, hard to see that three is bigger than 2.24. Um, but if we have them all to the same or order of magnitude, um, then it makes it much easier to see that the numbers all align with each other. We're going to monospace the text that corresponds to numbers, again, to make that easier. Um, so that if we have, for example, here, a number that takes up more digits, it also takes up more space. Um, and that turns the numbers in your table into a kind of bar visualization of sorts. Uh, but we'll come back to that and see if we can improve on that. Avoid having too many capitals. Um, take a look at the technical challenge column here. And this is how it looks when it's once it's tidy before it looked like this. So that it was just a lot of, is this new information? Is this a new column? Is it just a new word? Um, whereas if we get rid of all the capitals, it's just a little bit smoother. Um, we're going to add some text hierarchy with a bit of color and text sizing. We're going to add some personality, adding our fonts in there. We're going to make it easy to follow things. So again, it's about that eye movement and keeping that simple for people. And um, either by adding some zebra stripes like this, or you can add a little hover stripe. Um, that will highlight a row once you've put your mouse over it. Um, aligning the columns nicely so that everything reads straightforwardly, avoiding wrapping things so that the rows are all the same heights, and having sensible column widths so that you're not having to jump around to see the information that you need to see. Um, and I think one of the key ones when we're talking about stories with data is thinking what actually is the story in this table and what order do my columns need to be in um, so that it makes sense of, of what's going on. Um, so we put everything in the right order. And then we can use some colors to show and tell stuff. Um, we can color it by episode if we want to, um, or we can color it by, yeah, colored it by series here. Not particularly informative, um, adds a fun rainbow to it. Um, but one of the fun things that we can do is add in some data bar elements. And again, I'll share the code for this um, on, on the website. Um, but you can add uh, bars into your tables. And this is actually so much easier to see the difference between numbers than when we had it with just numbers um, earlier. If you do the quick comparison there and then do it with bars, um, just the order of magnitude um, means that it's, it's so much easier to look at it this way. So we've got some bars in. And then we can also use meaningful colors. We started with colors. Let's apply some colors to our table. And um, for those of you who have followed the Bake Off as we run it in the UK, for a long time, it was uh, hosted by Mel and Sue. Um, and then it moved to be hosted by uh, Noel and uh, various other uh, compadres. So it's been nice to see um, the, I don't know, I find it quite fun to see how the audience grew and grew and grew and grew uh, when it was Mel and Sue that were presenting it. And then it kind of stagnated. <laughs> for a bit after that point. But if you're going to be using colors, um, then you probably need to add a little bit of a legend uh, so that you can see what's going on. Um, and there we go. So there we've got a table in which we started with this one, which was fairly basic, but did the job. And we finished with this one um, in which everything lines up nicely. It's easy to read. Um, it's pleasing to look at. And the, the bars help tell a really good story of what's been going on in the data. So that was point number six. We've got another four to go, but they will be quick ones. And um, if you're going to have additional information, then you want to signpost it. And uh, one of the fun things that you can do with uh, when you're creating a plot with ggplot is you can turn it into an interactive plot really easily uh, using the ggiraf package, uh, or the logo makes me think that maybe it should be pronounced giraffe. People pronounce it in different ways, but there's also a function inside it that is ggiraf giraffe. So who knows? Uh, I'm going to call it GGIRF, and you can take up the argument with me afterwards um, if you want to. But this is a really excellent way of going from a ggplot to an interactive plot so that you can then put on websites, or if you're using Corto, you can put it inside a Corto um, presentation, for example, which is what we're going to do. It allows you to show the main data story as the first thing that people see, and then they can access extra details that they're interested in by hovering over the data points that they want to look into. So it shows them lots of information about just one thing, the main story, rather than showing them 
an indigestible amount of information about everything. Um, and I think that's quite useful. Um, if, if those of you who work with dashboards and if you use Power BI, you'll be aware of the data labels and how you can't really decide how many data labels you want. You either have them all or you don't have them. Um, this is quite a nice way, using tooltips is a nice way around that problem, but you don't have to overwhelm people with a whole lot of information at the start. And the thing that I love about GGRF is that it respects all the ggplot styling that you've worked really hard to get right. And other people use Plotly um, and ggplotly, and that works well as well. But if sometimes I find that it, it kind of changes um, the, the aspect of the plot in a way that, um, that is kind of annoying when you spend a lot of time figuring out how to get it to look exactly the way that you want it to look. So again, different strengths and weaknesses to different packages. Um, but this is the one that I recommend, and I'm going to show you um, how, how it works. So. Um, I decided to recreate um, the, the cake that they show at the end of the, the Bake Off um, title sequence. It's a chocolate cake with raspberries plumped on top of it. Not that obvious, I can, I can see uh, from your facial expressions. But um, it was fairly straightforward to create. Um, again, just taking the data from the challenges. Um, and all I've done is um, just jittered the, the points. So all the points have the same coordinates of x equals 1 and y equals 1, so the points coordinates is all in the middle here. And then I've just um, jittered the points so that they're scattered all over the plot. And that's that's all I've done there. Um, I've then, um, yeah, I've then uh, just added a bit of theming that we did earlier. Uh, but again, there's not much text going on um, in there. So then all you need to do is use, um, instead of using gg geom jitter, which is what I had here, so here's my Geom Jitter. On the next slide, I'm using GGRF Geom Jitter Interactive. Um, and there are loads of geometries that are built into to GGRF to allow you to do this. So Geom Jitter Interactive is the same as it was earlier. The only other thing I need to say is to say the tooltip equals the, the value. Um, and the value is created um, through the pivot that we had earlier. So let's have a look and see what that does. Uh, we've gone from a standard plot to a plot that is interactive. Um, and then we need to feed it into the GGRF giraffe function that we talked about earlier. So this is our interactive plot. Um, and as you can see, I'm hovering over different data points and it's bringing up information. Now, we need to apply some of this text stuff that we've been talking about to these tooltips because they're not particularly readable as it stands. Um, we can do a bit of theming uh, to add extra text in, and then we want to manipulate the text that we're going to use. Oh, yes, manipulate the text we're going to use inside those. Uh, da, 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 a question about where the tidy data came from. Yes, I manipulated the tidy data. Um, I will, if you look at the most recent talk on my website, the full code is there for that table, and I will share it again um, when I share the slides from this uh, from this workshop. So uh, we need to manipulate text, text in the tables because at the moment, the text that we've got in there, um, it's fine. It just tells us what was included in the bake. Um, but it, we would like to know also who baked it and what series um, it was that they, they baked it in. Um, but importantly, I think the idea of signposting additional information is if you're going to hide stuff in the tooltips, um, then you need to give people a way of accessing it. So you need to tell them that there's more to see. Um, so that's all that I'm saying here. Just add a little bit of text to say that. Manipulate text in tables. So um, you've got your challenges from the Bake Off data. Um, and then we're going to remove the technical. We're going to pivot to longer. So we're amalgamating together into one column the signature bakes and the showstoppers so that we can see them all. Um, and then we're going to say that our tooltip content, this is where it gets fun. Okay, so I'm combining. We had some case win earlier, and we've got some if else going on here. So the tooltip content is going to be um, if there's nothing, if there if there is nothing in the ingredients, we're going to say nothing. If there is something in the ingredients, then we're going to put the list of ingredients in there. That we've tidied up a little bit. So then we've just tidied them up with a bit of uh, regex or regex, regular expressions, let's say. Um, tidied it all up, got rid of um, line breaks that shouldn't have been there, tried to standardize where the capitals are, um, just make it a little bit tidier to, to look at. And so this is what it looks like. Um, here is the original, the first start of it. So this is the tidied up text, which corresponds to uh, the bake that we're going to be adding into the tooltip. So we're pasting that in, and then we're pasting in two line breaks. 
and we're going to set the style to bold and we're going to put the name of the baker in there so that name comes from another column in our data set and then we are going to add in a little hyphen and a capital s which represents the word series and then we're going to grab the series number which is also another column in our data set and we're going to uh, pad that number so that if it's series two, it'll say zero two. If it's series 10, it'll say 10. And that means that the series have all got the same number of digits. Again, one of the principles that we talked about earlier, making sure that the text is always formatted in the same way so that you're not jumping around trying to figure out what's what. So we've got all that in, and then we're doing the same for the episodes, a capital E for episode, and then we're going to grab the episode number and pad that as well and create some span. So here, here you can see the effect, for example, uh, we see that there was a black forest ghetto, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that was baked by David in season one, episode one. And that's all been uh, created from the columns that we had in our data. And that means that we can then pull this information into the tooltips um, and use it as we explore the chocolate and raspberry bake. So here we see the effect that that has had. Um, we've got the name of the bake, what was inside it, who baked it and what series and what episode it was in. Um, and we're just pulling that in uh, from, from the data. So we've got our tooltip content there. And then we want to optimize the text for a functionality. So we've got it here um, and we want to align it with what we've done already. So we're going to use a bit of CSS to do that. We've got the background color. We're going to change the color of the text. We're going to change the uh, font as well so that we've got it all lined up nicely with the personality that we had elsewhere. We're then going to add some padding. You can see that there's a bit more padding around the box. I go back to the previous slide, the box was right up to the edges of the text there. Whereas if we add some padding in, it has some room to breathe. Again, same principles that we've been talking about all along. We are then going to make sure that we fix the width of the box because previously some of the boxes were really long. And so your eyes are jumping around trying to get to the end of that box. Whereas if we fix the width of it, um, it becomes much easier and everything's the same size. We're going to add some line height. Um, and again, I'll share all the code for doing this, uh, but you can fix the line height here. You can fix the border radius, etc. cetera. Uh, we're going to increase the spacing between letters. So this was a tip that I picked up um, from Oliver Schondorfer um, about creating readable text that's very small. Um, here we have the, the original text and the letters are a bit smashed together. And if we just add a little bit of extra spacing, um, it just becomes a little bit easier to read. Again, super subtle, but it does make a bit of a difference. And let me find the bit that does that. Yeah, letter spacing. And we're doing it so that it's relative to the font size as well. OK, uh, at this point, you're probably thinking, uh, yes, you're giving everything some space to breathe. I need some space to breathe too. I've got one last tip, and it will take me one minute to cover it, and then we can, we can chat. Um, so we have, we're going back to our original plot that we had. Um, it's nicely annotated, but it still needs a bit of space. Um, so don't worry too much about detaching those. Uh, that was because I broke my presentation by loading the React table um, thing, and then there was some conflict somewhere. So anyway, we're going to change the plot margin, um, and we're going to repeat 18 four times. So that means that there's going to be um, 18 points as a margin, top, bottom, left, and right, and all the way around our, our plot. Um, we're going to increase the line height in our subtitle um, so that that text has a bit more space to breathe as well. Um, and we're going to add a bit more margin to our subtitle so that it doesn't sit just straight on top of the bars. Again, just a bit of visual spacing going on there. And then here we go. So we've got the original and the uh, where we've ended up before and after. Again, subtle, but um, it is nicer to look at if there's a bit of space around it all. Um, so there we go. That so we made it to the end of the, the 10 tips that I, has, I had to share with you um, about using text better. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and I will stop sharing my screen and answer any questions that you have. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that, uh, like one, one was about uh, that I saw it before. Uh, when saving graphs as PNG to use in LaTeX, yeah, sometimes the fonts turn out to be so small that I have to change the height and width of the of graphs in GG save function 
manually? Is there mm -hmm. a way to handle this issue? I unmute uh, uh, all of you, so you can ask her your question directly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the font issue, I think, <coughs> excuse me, when I'm creating these, I tend to export the plot using ggsave. So if you decide in advance how big you want your plot to be, you can then adapt the font so that it works with that. Um, I think there is always going to be a little bit of trial and error in doing that. When working with LaTeX, you can set the font, um, the figure height and width, I think, within the, the code chunk options again. And um, you might want to look into the um, the out, it's either the out height or the out width, which is set different from the fig height and fig width. Um, and that might be part of what's going on with your with your text. Um, if you are creating plots in our studio and then exporting them with ggsave, I would recommend always specifying the size yourself. Um, otherwise, the size of your plot tied to the, the size of the viewer at the time when you were creating that plot. So to make it more reproducible, um, use ggsave with the width specified. It will make it much more consistent for you going forward. You'll know what to expect as well. OK. <laughs> People are saying I've made them hungry by talking about cakes so much. And I feel that's mission accomplished. <laughs> feel, free, feel free to to ask your question directly to Kai if you if you've got any uh, more questions. Yeah, please go ahead and mute yourself. Hello, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was blown away with all the tips. I really have uh, issues working with text. Uh, the question is. How would you like? Would you think it's not appropriate but possible to apply some of these tips for, uh, I don't know, graphs that are going to be in a scientific paper? Because you know there are really constraints about the formatting of the graphs. So mm -hmm. that's the question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah. I've Obviously, you want to choose fonts that are going to be appropriate for an academic paper. Um, and the, the ones that are used are probably slightly more um, on the fun side of things, although there's not, you know, not to be said that academic papers can't be fun as well. Um, I think you still want to be thinking about text hierarchy. So even if you're going for, say, you know, Times New Roman as your font, you still can add some text hierarchy to that. Um, I also think you can still think about in plot annotations. Um, so I did a project for a client uh, fairly recently, which was for an academic paper, um, and they had uh, initially had a plot where, um, yeah, there were dots going down the middle, and then they'd wanted to print the error margins on the side. So you had stuff in the middle of the plot, stuff down the side, you had the p values somewhere else. Um, and by creating in plot annotations where you dot and you had the error bars either side of that and the values above it, it just meant that everything you were just looking at the pattern that did that through the data rather than looking at something that did that and then trying to figure out what the value is and, um, and so on and so forth. So I I think the the reducing eye movement stuff, the text hierarchy stuff, um, all still applies to to the work that you're doing. Um, and tables in academic publications tend to be quite restricted if you're following, for example, the APA guidelines. But um, you can still think about what text goes into that, even if you're not at liberty to change all the formatting the way that you would want to. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice talk. Thank you very much. We've got one more question from Giovanni. Would you like to uh, ask yourself? Uh, he said, I've never used uh, interactive plots. Is it possible to use them in a PowerPoint presentation? Um, good question. I think the answer is yes. Um, so the, the plots that you create interactively with TGIRF, you can export as HTML elements which means that you can then embed them as HTML elements in whatever you're using. So I think there is a way of embedding HTML elements into PowerPoint. Um, I haven't done it myself, but um, but I think it is possible. Um, but that's that's what you would need to look up it, rather than having to look up necessarily TGRF and integration. If you look for embedding HTML elements, that should get you on the right path to an answer. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? There was another question from Esther. I don't know if you answer it. Is it possible to use flag colors in the uh, place of colors 
for example, when you're comparing data from different countries? Yeah, I don't see why not. You would just need to be careful that there aren't any sensitivities around the meaning of different colors in different flags. If you look at the the UK flag, for example, each color is tied to a different nation. So if you were to pick out just one of those colors and say that represented everybody, you might get into um, slight controversial waters there. Um, so yeah, but you can you can do that. Um, I've had a client recently who was looking at um, the performance of different companies in their dashboard, and they use the colors of those um, those company logos to, to do that. Um, the, the only caveat I would say when using colors is if you're taking colors from lots of different places, they can look a bit disjointed. And uh, so my my top tip for that um, is to blend in one common color, and then it mutes all your colors a little bit and gives them a common aesthetic. And you can do that quite easily using Monochroma. Um, and I've recently turned that into a, a Shiny app, which allows you to, to do that without necessarily being um, using R. Uh, so that was quite useful for some clients recently. Um, so if you, I can I can do a quick demo of that if that would be if that would be useful. Um, but if you if you have a look for the the Monochroma um, Shiny app, you can see how you can take different colors and uh, blend in a third color, and that should. Uh, do something nice for you. It's also quite nice because it gives you muted colors, which are generally considered to be a good idea from an accessibility point of view. The, the more primary colors um, can be a bit overstimulating if there's too many of them and they're all um, quite bold colors. Um, whereas if you've blended in a, a common color, it tends to, tends to work quite nicely against that phenomenon. And um, here's a link to, to give that a go. Those of you who code shiny apps will see that I haven't fixed the the fact that it gives you an error if you haven't put any data in, but that's going to be uh, something to look at when I have a spare time, a spare moment in the future. Yeah, one more question is, uh, what do you think about Plotly for making interactive uh, graphs? Yeah, so Plotly is, Plotly is good um, because, uh, you know, Plotly is widely used um, and people use it a lot. The, the, the issue that I had when I tried to use it was that I had formatted my GG plots very carefully and then I fed it into Plotly um, through GG Plotly and it reorganized stuff and changed the margins and changed my text formatting. And um, and it was a bit like, oh, I, like I, I did all those things very deliberately and then it had opinions about where things should be. Whereas I find that um, GGRF is much more straightforward to use. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to have opinions about uh, where things should be, which which is nice. Um, I'm not sure about the accessibility um, side of both of those. I think there are pros and cons to both of them, and um, so worth worth looking into. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot, there's a lot of chat about observable for interactive plots as well, um, and I've been trying to teach myself to to do that. But actually, having found GGRF, it's it's a great shortcut to getting a, an interactive plot in a language that you already know. Yeah, Sally's commenting that Plotly can delete information and stuff. So yeah, it can it can be a bit annoying. So uh, yeah, give give GGR a go. But for those of you who love GGR Plotly, keep going with that and, and see if you can apply some of the tips that we've covered today to your plots with that as well. Any further questions? Thank you very much. So that was amazing. Uh, and uh, so we learned a lot. Uh, you uh, are going to share your material uh, on your website, isn't it? And yeah. we are going to post the recording on our website. So uh, if any of you like miss any parts of the talk, you can rewatch it again. Yeah. And I'll share the full code for the, the tables on, on the page as well. So you can. You can copy paste that and like uh, yeah i say this on my website and i'll say it here again um just reuse anything that you find that i've made that's out in that in the public domain that's how i learned um you know people like cedric who were posting that stuff online and i was like oh that's how i did that okay great um and then we all learn from each other and the community is enriched from that so um yeah reuse stuff um and if you get stuck give me a shout um if you're working for an organization where you think they could do with some training like this then get in touch as well because that's something that i really enjoy doing um, but yeah, any way that I can help, just uh, I'd be delighted to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. See you next month.
for uh, another interesting event. So we'll let you know soon all about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and have a good evening, everyone.